great. I think we are um, we are ready to go. So um, good afternoon, everybody, or um, good morning or good evening, depending on on your time zone. And we are very happy to welcome you at this book launch event. And uh, let me do a very brief introduction to what is uh, what will um, go on here for for an hour or so. Uh, my name, first of all, is Ryan Knuttel. I'm a professor um, at uh, Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, and I will be uh, guiding um, you through this event. So we will have a, a brief uh, book presentation talk by the author or one of the authors of the book, Mark Esposito, talking about the great mobilization uh, strategies and designs for a, a smarter global future. So it, it's a big topic. So there's hopefully a lot to, a lot to talk, talk about as well. Um, Mark is a uh, Harvard-based economic economist and uh, also a policy fellow here at IIPP and uh, works with lots of governments really across the world and uh, and perhaps untypically for an academic is also a, uh, a really interested in in talking to wider audiences through accessible books which of course is a, is a great thing because that makes a dialogue with uh, with more people and more audiences of course uh, really possible and welcome and then we have a, a discussion for the book as well and of course we are welcoming all comments and questions uh, from you, uh, the listener. So whatever questions and comments you have, you can put uh, in the chat and on the Q&A function rather, and uh, we'll go through them and uh, take them one by one. Um, uh, and But we have a discussant. Discussant is one of our students actually at IIPP. We, we have a wonderful master in public administration program. And one of the students uh, is the discussant uh, for the book. Uh, Wallace uh, Greenslade is the discussant. She uh, uh, originally comes from uh, New Zealand, but for the time being, she's here in UK studying with us. So uh, the way we are we have thought about it, this uh, program today is that Mark will talk about the book in uh, without any slides, I think, but just to sort of to cover the base, the key topics, and you know, but also I think the the rationale and motivation behind the book for for about um, 20, 20 minutes, twenty five minutes. And after that, we have uh, Wallace's uh, initial sort of like uh, reaction and questions and comments. And then we, we come to you, the audience, and uh, and um, that should take us um, 60 minutes or so. So, Mark, whenever you're ready, um, uh, keep the floor to you uh, to present the book. And thanks right, for, well, for joining us. Thanks to, uh, to you, Rainer, for making this possible. Looking forward to the conversation with you, Wallace, as well. And thanks to the entire team at the Institute, right, for having nonetheless welcomed me as, as a policy fellow for now three years, right? I started in 2021. And so I, um, so like a COVID fellow, if such, such a term exists, right, in many ways. Allow me to then walk you through a little bit of the, the contents of the book and what brought us to write. So um, my two co-authors, uh, Olaf Grof, who is based out of, of uh, Haas in uh, Berkeley, and uh, uh, Terence Se, who's based out of uh, Halt International Business School. So we know each other for quite a few years. We've been doing some writing together. And during the pandemic, we, of course, uh, started to write more about what could be simplified some form of uh, uh, post-pandemic recovery. Uh, so we, we ran a summit in June 2020. Uh, we were thinking that the kind of economic model that were arising from the pandemic, we, we coined it in a very trivial forms, uh, coronomics. And then we started to invite people to our event and asking questions uh, uh, more about where do they see the world shifting. And we, we were, I think, uh, all in under the assumption that we were in an inflection point where we would not go back to where we were coming from. And I think there was a number of, of hard data that supported that. Um, also, before the pandemic, we knew that we were shifting rapidly. And if we want to look at the more of a macro level, our institutional frameworks were changing. Uh, our The effectiveness of uh, top-down designs that were coming from uh, the larger multinational entities were becoming weaker and weaker. Uh, we started to notice, uh, so like convergence towards the center was equally becoming quite weak. And so as a matter of fact, uh, more of the public opinion was distributed across uh, more polarized uh, debates and, and ideology were kind of being captured by this more radical views. And so it was becoming difficult for us to imagine that 
we will simply go back to a sense of convergence, as we call it across the book several times. And so from the initial conversation that, that uh, rose from a summit, we decided to go deeper and say, well, what if now, rather than having maybe 10 or 15 people come into the summit, we interview more and we try to ask questions about where do they see the, the direction of travel taking us? And that's what we did. So we started uh, with a bit of background research. We had a framework in place that we have called Flip It that was sort of like helping us to navigate this like denormalization phases where we were thinking across the world, every time that we have a fundamental crisis, we tend to see a number of different forces at place that will build new formal logics, they will consolidate in new forms of business models and practices, and then there will be an all impact across industries, regions, uh, sectors, and are we capable of rapidly succeeding the crisis into some form of innovation. And that's where the conversation started. So the framework was instrumental for our thought process. And then we started to collect interviews. And so we interviewed uh, roughly 100 people across the world. Uh, we did a job of geographical distribution, industry, seniority. Uh, we wanted to represent as much as we could. Um, a cohesive voice that will give us a sense about where we think we can show uh, some sort of like consistency in our in our project. And so after about a year and a half uh, of interviews and writing alongside, uh, we started to see a more advanced draft of our work and we were ready to go to print early 2023. Uh, we were to like delayed uh, by our publisher, MIT Press, and then in February, the crisis with Ukraine and Russia happened. And so we had to go back to the writing board and then add the dimension of Russia as a global player that was now largely disrupting uh, what we thought could have been a very different scenario before the war happened. And so we uh, integrated the Russia part. We equally started to see India becoming more critical in our conversation. So we add a part about India. And then we came out with a book in uh, October 2023. So that's sort of like to give you a bit of a chronological order where the book started, the summit, the interviews. So why did we write this book? So we wrote this book for a number of reasons. We are, the three of us, we are what we call academic practitioners. So we are all appointed somewhere in universities. We went through a formal uh, scholarship processes, but we equally started to work closer to either governments or businesses or industries. And so we tend to have appreciation for our action ability. We equally started to feel that the world was in need of uh, not necessarily answer, but, but at least like a reconstruction of the big questions so that we could orient them towards where we think largely this new frequency models are gonna take us. And then we wanted to understand ourselves whether we were really into a significant decline in period of our history or whether this was a transition. And so the answer to the question, if there was a first answer to the question, we're definitely shifting rapidly and seeing the exhaustion of the Bretton Woods rule. So we see what has been a dominating principle for the last 80 years clearly in crisis. We don't think this is a, a, a like a precipitation per se. We consider this to be more of a transition to a different form of value creation. And this transition tends to also be uh, supported by some of the people we interviewed. Just to give an example, uh, when we interviewed Alec Ross, who is, a, is, a, is an American uh, sort of like former policymaker who was the chief technology advisor to Secretary Clinton and worked in the Obama administration, he wrote a book called The Rage in 2020s. In his book, Ross talks about the 2020s as this funnel of time that's going to take us from one organizing principle to the other one. And so that's pretty much where we started to feel that maybe we were really in, in this transitionary uh, period of time. Now, transition are violent. They, they have a lot of disruption. They have a lot of discontinuities. This is also why we see a lot of denormalizations. But this transition also gives us an opportunity for rethinking our institutional framework. And so at the same time as we were trying to define how we are surrendering to the evidence that the new world order is rising, if for, the, for the lack of a better term, 
We also knew that it was not deterministic per se. It wasn't coming with a specific set of prescriptions. It is entirely up to us to build and craft this new direction. And so we operated with uh, a bit of, uh, I would say, paradoxic mindset. We started to think, and I'm quoting Parakana, that was one of our interviewers, interviewees as well, we are converging and diverging at the same time. We are converging towards a new set of raffle rules and engagement, and they're not necessarily easy for us to navigate, especially when our inherited principles of reference that tend to be 20th century theoretical models. But we also diverge in to a point that likely our next wave of globalization would not look like the first one. And so we might be calling deglobalization, we don't think it's deglobalizing, it's just globalizing differently. So there's more emphasis on local, there's more tribalism, as we mentioned before, there's a larger accentuation of polarization. And we find it difficult for a democratic system to eventually uh, uh, represent the right level of principal agent dilemmas, and maybe because of the vested interest and also because in many circumstances, we have seen democracies uh, shift into more uh, radical uh, choices or what uh, we can call a bit in a hyperbolic way, the tyranny of the majority, where a majority of people eventually will select or elect extremely difficult right, uh, choices. Example, for example, for Brexit, where uh, the majority who went for the referendum has completely repressed the ability for the minority to be part of the European Union. Or the example of Trump, and when Trump was elected, even against the, the popular vote, he sort of like represented the election of a president against uh, millions of Americans who did not want to vote for him. And so this extremely stark contrast started to show that also in democratic exercises, the effectiveness of representation is becoming challenged. So to give you a bit more of, uh, of context in, uh, in the, so like what we call the verticals, as we were interviewing people, it was becoming quite evident that few, let's say, plots, a different language, plots, buckets, like convergence, area of frequency were emerging. So we organized them under, you know, so like an umbrella. And we said, look, what seems to be very, very common is a conversation of technology becoming more than just technology. It's almost becoming an infrastructure. And this is not the digital infrastructure that we had at the beginning of the millennial when we wanted to digitize the analogic. This is more of what we call a cognitive infrastructure in which technologies that is mimicking the brain is permeating many sides of our life. So we have seen the cognitive economy entering into biological, uh, physical, of course, infrastructural, emotional, psychological. There's an entire area of work in which the cybernetics of integration between machines and humans is now a topic to discuss. And we are far from ready from a conversation that can navigate from a regulatory perspective, from a liability perspective, but equally in terms of ethics, we are far from understanding the navigation principle for that. And that is sort of like we thought is another, more than underpin, it could be an underpinning, but it can also be an overarching structure. So technology running across. And then we went deeper into this and we started to see that there were specific declination of that. So we saw that uh, true, mainly the uh, forced stay at home that the that COVID has imposed upon many of us, the size of the internet has grown. And so today on, on a global level, roughly 30% of the internet has expanded in comparison to before. The internet is a larger infrastructure than prior to COVID. And with the larger infrastructure, of course, we have a significant degree of decentralization that has happened. Just to give you some context, from pre to post COVID, roughly 2 billion people have been given access to the internet. And so this is a significant number in comparison to, of course, the fact that more people defines more access, but more access equally defines larger, I would say, spectrum or rough ramifications. With the extension of the internet to the peripheries, if we want to call it this way, we have seen the rise of new value models that are now becoming pivoted. So in some cases, we've seen the web, so like pivoting with the idea that decentralization could become a web three proposition. We've seen more and more automation happening in many parts of supply chains, 
So today, technology is, is enabling millions of suppliers to be part of a larger uh, concentration of supply demand uh, propositions. Uh, we're seeing business model rising from all over the world. We used to have uh, a concentration of business model across few locations. And today, uh, innovation is a scattered conversation. It happens in many parts of the world. It just happens differently. And so time is captured, and time is not. But we have seen that too. And we also seen money uh, becoming fundamentally a decentralized narrative. And today, we do yet talk about Bitcoins, cryptocurrency, but no longer just about currencies. We're also talking about the inherent value of blockchain that is now becoming more and more of an infrastructure reference for the, uh, the verification of transactions. And not necessarily just in Europe uh, or in North America or in uh, North, uh, uh, North Asia, but also in what we call the emerging economies that are rapidly leapfrogging in, in tech, with technology there and making them uh, globally uh, connected to, uh, to the supply chains. Now, interesting on that, when we were discovering this decentralization, we also discovered that the concept of emerging economy is kind of obsolete. Every country is emerging these days. There is no longer a country that is emerged and a country is emerging. So we started to see less, I would say, more nuances, maybe in the definition, but less stark uh, differences between what we used to call developed economies and developing one. And that has created, of course, an increasing sense of multipolarity that we perceive it, a sense that the older gatekeepers are no longer gatekeeping as before. There's a sense of vacuum in leadership globally. And also the fact that multipolarity is creating this multiple poles of power that are emerging at the same time. So all of this were equally like represented by some of our conversations that we went into the challenges of a world that is becoming more and more dependent on technology. And so we spoke about, well, in our book, we, of course, talk about cybersecurity. But if you're looking at some of the reports of the World Economic Forum, it is rightly called cyber insecurity, right? And so the fact that we are largely exposed to cyber threats and cyber um, terrorism and the fact that we no longer have all of our uh, value store into the physical world, but most of this is becoming a digital transaction. And so there's a whole part about the work where we were capturing inklings that the cybersecurity uh, narrative will continue to grow in the years to come. Then we shifted over to climate. And so we started to see how a lot of our interview is where basically mentioning the climate change paradigm as we was originally formulated to be mainly a failed paradigm and shifting over to, I would say, a more uh, contemporary language. So mitigation, climate economy, climate adaptation. There's a clear sense that uh, the trade-off do not work anymore. And we want to think differently about this. And even before uh, the COP28, uh, which was the first COP after the book was released, we could really feel in some of our conversation, the transition towards a different way of rethinking, for example, our energy model. And that was already, I think, much more plausible rather than thinking about heavily decarbonizing. It was much more about decarbonizing while transitioning. So we started to feel there was a timeline that kicked in. And the final part of the conversation in terms of the frequency was, of course, China. Now, this, this frequency, they all start with C. It makes it easier to make it more uh, in terms of dissemination of knowledge, if we talk about the six C's or the five C's. And so, you know, we have co cognitive economy, COVID-19 triggering the expansion of the internet decentralization. We have uh, crypto and everything related to that part. We have cybersecurity, we have climate, and we have China. And so China was, of course, another big, big conversation has, not necessarily just as a country, but as an entirely alternative sense a reference system from before and we see this these days, right, from alternative technology offers to alternative infrastructure proposition, alternative ch uh, financial models, to the point that the only uh, challenger to, to like the Washington DC institution has been what Beijing has been able to pull forward. And so this was kind of the, the narrative as it was emerging that, and I'll summarize so we can start our discussion. Uh, the end of a world to the degree of dependency from the old Bretton Woods model, for sure. 
transitional to, and we feel the impact of this, the, the sense of a big vacuum in moving forward, but equally the opportunity of rethinking the creation of a new infrastructure as it emerges, uh, non-deterministic to the point that it's up to us in the next few years to really define and devise the direction where we like our institutions to go and a concentration of, of frequency points that emerge from our, our uh, interviews so the cognitive economy, COVID-19, uh, crypto, cyber, climate, and China. And that became kind of, you know, our, our story. So we are right now a uh, few months after the launch. We've been uh, doing several events around the world. Uh, the book has been well-received, and we, we got uh, shortlisted for awards as well, which is easy, uh, is easy to aspire to, but not easy to achieve because I think Today, it's difficult sometimes to differentiate how a book can really contribute. But I think the fact that we are globally distributed and we tap on multiple audiences help us to have a global conversation about this. And so the more we represent this conversation, the more we are learning from the localization of the conversation on how the book can resonate. Um, the book has become a, an executive course in some institutions as well, adapted somehow to the local needs. And we are hoping for the book to be nothing more than an anchor for a conversation about where are we heading from here? How do we design these institutions uh, in this framework? How do we build a generation of what we call design activists? So people that are going to fundamentally drive this. And how do we keep going? Because staying standing still is not good news. And so this is, I would say, in, in the time you gave me, Reiner, a bit of the the gist of the narrative of the book uh, and looking forward to our remainder of time with you, uh, Wallace, and the, the, the guest we have, the, the attendees. Thank you so much, Mark. And, and yes, as, as I say, it's a, it's a conversation starter and, uh, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great conversation starter for sure. And, and I have uh, multiple questions, but uh, for that, uh, I, I'd like to give the floor to to Wallace, uh, who's not only our student, but also, of course, a civil servant. Uh, so uh, she can speak to uh, that as well, if, if, you, if you would like to. What does it mean from a, you know, a, a, a civil service pr perspective as well, as we are you know, going from one world order, as it were, to a, a quite a different one? Uh, so, Laurie, if you don't, Wallace. Mm, okay, great. Kia ora koutou katoa. I'm Wallace. So I come from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I have a civil service background working in climate policy and I grew up in, in the green land of Wellington, which is kind of surrounded by hills and parliament. And both of these things very much shaped where I went in my career and where I'll go going forwards. Um, <clears throat> I think it's useful to kind of ground ourselves in where we're coming from, particularly because I've got the civil service lens, but I've also got the effect that I'm a young person who has begun working in a post-COVID world. And I think that's really important when, when we're talking about this book in terms of what what a new social order looks like going forward coming from this idea of liminality or coming from this idea of kind of change <clears throat> so um as Reiner said this book is kind of aimed at all audiences so I'm very much going to continue in that mm -hmm. vein. and I think it's really nice Mark that you finished with kind of a recap of the story that you felt that the book was telling because I'm going to come back to you with the story that I took from it which I think is quite interesting mm -hmm. to have that kind of dialogue between the two. So for me, the story was painted as, as this. One, we are moving from a 20th century logic to a new logic in a multipolar, mm -hmm. hyper-complex cognitive era, which you refer to as this kind of fourth industrial revolution. Two, we're mm -hmm. going to need new institutions for this new world. Three, we're going to need new governance and leadership in this new world. Or we're going to need new capabilities within those institutions for this new world. Five, trust becomes the most important part of the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. And five, mm -hmm. young people are defining value differently. And we need to think really hard now about what that means for the social order going forward. So that was kind of the, the story that I took. And that's why I refer to the, the yeah. physicality that I'm coming from, because I think it's interesting that different people can take such different things from a story like this and I think that's the that's mm. the real value in talking about these kind of five c's and talking about these trends at, at such a high level um so we're, we're talking about turbulence we're talking about volatility we're talking about risk um 
One of the things, though, that I found really powerful reading through this was the really hopeful and empowering framing that you put around the future. And I know that you and the other authors did that quite intentionally. Um, I think what was really helpful about that is that while uncertainty and risk are very scary and we all kind mm. of shy away from them on a, on a daily basis, actually a hopeful narrative can be incredibly powerful for enabling action. And so I wondered as a kind of starting point, because we're talking about mm -hmm. stories and we're talking about the way that this book flows, how mm -hmm. do you see the role of storytelling and crafting narratives in the fourth industrial revolution? So Wallace, first of all, thanks for having capture. I mean, the way you capture it also is an incredible way for me to learn how it's perceived. And, and all of this is one of the reasons why before I was mentioned to Reiner, running these events around the world is helpful for us to understand the difference between the ideation of the book and then the implementation in the real world, right? Um, look, I think the collective narrative that made the 20th century theory so powerful was straightforward, right? It was uh, where we're coming from a period of scarcity. And the idea was growth will be a form of reinstating dignity opportunities. And we had this, this incredibly powerful incremental narrative in which from one generation to the other, we simply can improve. And if you're looking at fundamentally, most of the hard data shows that in any dimension from GDP growth to number of people on, on the planet to you know GDP per capita to assets, we have, of course, improved largely, no matter whether we are in the least performing part of the world, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, or the best performing part of the world, which is China, and anybody in between, the world is better off today than what it was, you know, if you measure it in the specific proxies. But there was a clear narrative that was driving this forward. I think we don't have a narrative today. We are, I think we're broma we are romanticizing with the narrative of the past because he has worked for many. Uh, just imagine the number of people we, are, we lifted out of poverty in the previous century, right? But it's not working anymore in the same ways. But we are in the absence of a new narrative. So I think the idea of the book, of course, we don't aspire to become the narrative, but to be maybe the, the initial uh, conversation that will craft the narrative is to rethink that now is the time for us to write what kind of rules of engagement we want to have moving forward, which brings me to a point that I think you mentioned, which is so important. You, most of our growth model were never designed around people. They were designing the, around the industrial policy the make factories or the farming, uh, the farming unit as the creation of value. So people were working in, in factory because it was the best way they had to contribute, to grow, and the entire way of organizing labor uh, and education and so like our entire social security uh, algorithm was defined around an industrial model. Today, that industrial model is failing simply because no longer we're not working in factories anymore, most of us, but also because we are a much more sophisticated, uh, you know, generation. And so we, we don't necessarily feel that emotion, desire, aspirations, they have to be secondary to just labor. And so we are much more human-centric in our manifestation of life, but we're not human-centric in our apl application of institution or, or, or employment or policies. And so I think question that we would like to have is how do we start building a more humanized or human-centric narrative that is going to shape the size or the, the mandate of these institutions? And storytelling is a great way for this not to be an intellectual conversation. Yes, to be the way for people to feel engaged. And, you know, back in the days, everybody knew that if you work hard, your effort eventually will yield results. And so it was easy to translate, no matter whether you were doing this by maybe going to school and educating yourself to postgraduate and maybe becoming one of the aspired professions, or whether you were doing this as what we used to call the blue collars, because proportionally, everybody has an opportunity to make a difference. Today, I think our social immobilism is, is problematic, and we have to start rethinking what is a society looking like, especially where a large part of our physical tasks are largely delegated to technology. And this is now one side of the story. With technology becoming mimicking the brain, the same narrative will go about, is the job really designed for dignifying a person, or was it simply a translation from 
a factory job into an office job without thinking that eventually one day we had technology powerful enough to take over some of that repetition. So I think we have to start rethinking the narrative. And I believe storytelling is an incredible way for building a generation of people can aspire to something that is greater than our current model, which seems to look at the past, um, but not necessarily having the same energy towards building the future. And I think in many parts of the world, we're stuck into this liminal phase where to some degree we are aware, it's almost like the consciousness tells you that we are moving forward, but our physical infrastructure does not allow us to know how to take the first step. And all we need is to actually facilitate the first step. We think that the transition to a different organizing principle doesn't happen by having, uh, you know, to use uh, Mariana's language, a moonshot only. But moonshots are this radical idea that needs to be in place for bottom-up innovation to occur. I think it's exactly the same principle, right? We need to have a vision so that we can inspire action on the ground. And that is the part that I think that is uh, important and critical in storytelling can make it a distributed uh, story rather than concentrated or elitist. Hmm. Yeah, and it's really interesting as well then how we approach that in terms of the educational systems that we're working with today to try and build those capabilities for a future generation that are going to deal with situations we can't even really imagine. And so I know in the book you talk a lot about um, how we can kind of embrace things like scenario-based foresighting and blue sky thinking. Um, and one of the other things that you talk about a lot is this idea of a zeroth principle approach. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting in this context of, you know, setting up future generations, thinking about increased volatility, but also just a world that we can't even imagine. Um, and I'm particularly both intrigued and confused by this idea of the zero principle thinking, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the idea of starting from not first principles, but from building blocks that have se seemed kind of unimaginable before. So That's I suppose right. it's, it's sort of normal that I'm a bit confused by that because, you know, it's quite human to be influenced by all of the social norms that we see every day. But um, mm -hmm. I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit more about this idea of zero principle sure. thinking and, and how we can start to build those capabilities in future generations today. Yeah, you know, it, well, it, it, I think it's a great narrative. I say it's zero principle rather than first principle. It's a narrative that is it could be aspirational. It's also true that if I have to bring it down to what does it really mean. That's where, for example, historical some historical uh, reference can help us. When we uh, integrated or developed the GDP in 1934, it was revolutionary. It changed fundamentally the way economy are measured. That, if you think about it, was a zero principle in the way we started to think about compound or aggregation of data for the sum of goods and services that are sold and exchanged in an economy. When we started to develop, mainly through the social market economy that Germany brought forward, developed by the Nordics, and then became what we call today social welfare. Social welfare is an incredible zero principle. Even the concept of universal education is zero principle. The fact that we are guaranteeing education just because being a member of a community, right? So I think in the past, we have seen many moments where we have come to a, a realization in which radical idea could really create entirely zero principle that then, then build the derivatives on first principle and so on and so forth. What we're lacking today is that desire and course to think radically. And so this is really where the zero principle goes on. It goes back to what I was saying before. In an incremental model, radical thinking does not belong to it because it's outside of any form of distribution in any graph. The, revol the mathematization of the economy by building financial model to justify the measurement of value, it is a mathematical, mathematical model that tends to be bounded by an X and a Y axis. And so we've been thinking with some degree of limitation on the possibilities. In fact, in many cases, we talk about what makes sense. We use this language. We say sensible. Sometimes we, we call it plausible. And it looks like if I ask, uh, for example, a group of manager about what do you think could happen? The common language would be best, worst, and most probable case scenario. But they are within a boundary that is already predetermined. That means that all we can aspire is second, third, fourth order effect, rather than thinking radically about like.
we did it in the past. What, for example, should money look like in a world in which centralized control of money is no longer trusted? What happens when, for example, social welfare or social security no longer fits because the demographical changes that we had do not fit the life that we had in 1960 when social welfare was largely distributed? I think these questions that are so big it requires the aspiration to think big as well. And that is a zero principle effort in many ways. So that's what we mean. And so it goes into, for example, healthcare. We've been largely thinking of healthcare as uh, sick care, right? Rather than necessarily uh, healthcare that and is, is, is institutionalized by doctors and clinics and, and hospitals. Uh, we think about education as being kind of symmetrical. We have batches, individual assignments, and if you think about it, if you just step back, it's very structured. But what if education is not necessarily fitting into the narrative of how emotion or emotional compass is evolving in our lifetime? So what if we start thinking about education, maybe decoupling this from employability? Because so far, most educational programs, they tend to have, I would say, some degree of correlation, either positive or negative, with uh, employability. But employability is a form of, of utility, economic utility, where my effort as an educated person has to serve society in a specific way. But what if knowledge, education, and employability do not pertain to the same equation? I think these are big questions that requires the thinking that needs to go into zero. Just in case people are wondering what zero, because when the number zero was introduced in algebra, it fundamentally changed the way we do mathematics. And after that, we were able to have, you know, derive other mathematical rules. It's the same idea. What are the kind of radical ideas that we can bring up there? Rethinking our frameworks, institutional aspirations, that will go back to your first question, build a new narrative. So we're not bounded by the experience of the present or the past, but we're much more actually enticed by the pools of the future. And I think this is the kind of generation we need to have, capable of thinking beyond the convention, the conformity of a system that has largely worked. So it's also hard to break through. See, when we lost everything during World War II, it wasn't too hard for people to aspire for something better. Today, it's difficult because we are comforted by a lot. But the point is not to be comforted by a lot, is to have the courage to think what is really the 21st century entropic question about you know, humans on Earth. And I think this is why the book aspires for people to read it and feel, yes, I am empowered to think in that way because I do not have a dependence anymore from a system of reference that is largely incremental. So that's kind of you know, the story. I think it's really interesting to think about what that looks like in government and possibly this is an op opportunity for Reiner to come in with some of the thinking around capabilities because I'm really curious about how we can intentionally build spaces for that within our institutions, you know, starting with the current existing institutions that we have now to move towards that future. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, uh, Wallace, for, uh, for throwing the ball back to me. And then, indeed, one of my questions was around uh, the idea of uh, what kind of capabilities we need for from the policymaking perspective. But I think before we go there, because it's it's a great um, great topic, I want to bring in the audience. Uh, as you see, Mark, there are like three questions. Yes. Maybe you can yeah. maybe you can take those, and then we come back to the capabilities. Sure. sure. And because the audience question is, is maybe goes to the some of the genesis of the book and why you took some things in and why why you know why you talk about the fourth industrial revolution in the in the age of climate emergency and then we come back to that yeah dialogue you have thank you yeah. look i'll try to do this uh quick reiner so so yeah. project on your question about india look i think we have uh experienced india being a country large in size but their their you know economic footprint in on a global level was not too high and so in the last few years, we started to see the country rising, not just in terms of GDP, but I think globally, the India is much more in the maps and also in our headspace than before. And I think it's a country that is rising as an alternative pole to, let's say, the East and the West, so like the dynamics. Uh, it's a country that has a still a really young population, so the prospect for growth are coming from just their, their, their composition. And it's also a country that has been 
pivoting the most successful uh, scaling of Pfizer on a global level. They went for, they administered 2.2 billion doses, and they went through that after a first wave of insect, oh, actually, unsuccessful delivery. And so what I think India is important is for us to understand that, especially back to the point that maybe we'll talk together, Reiner, especially in policy, when we can replicate with large scale in complex geography and countries and succeed, there's a lot of replication that can be applied to other parts of the world. So I think India is a country that we need to use as an incredible laboratory of what could possibly happen in terms of food, the climate challenge that we're going to have, right? Which is, it's going to be not necessarily as meaningful if it's the same breakthrough happens in small countries. We don't have the same degree of complexity. So I think it goes back to a question that came from uh, uh, also from uh, from um, from another uh, person. I think it was Ama, right? Then I'm going to go to the question from Sumana. So um, the question on the climate action, right? Um, so so just to give you a sense, um, in the fourth industrial revolution, the, the first first of all, the fourth industrial revolution does not exist as as it sounds. It's an aspiration. The started from a World Economic Forum event in 2016 by uh, recognizing that technology was permeating more layers of our life. So the original proposition was that technology entering the physical, the digital, and the biological domains. And when that happened, it redefined the interoperability of our society. And so the question will be, can we use technologies to advance some of the most important questions, for example, climate modeling? We use technology to rethink in the input of climate on protein and agriculture. So there's a clear link between the aspiration of the fourth industrial revolution and, of course, uh, climate. We know today that technology can be an accelerant towards climate action. Uh, we hope that we'll use technology not just as an efficiency in, in strict economic terms, but also in terms of things like social environmental issues where we have deep needs. So that's to give you an answer to that. Um, to the question from uh, um, so from uh, Sumana, right, about ter technology inside out, right? So it's more related, uh, Sumana, on the fact that a lot of the technology are now using behavior as a way of modeling their value chains. And so it means that if before humans could be considered consumers, Today, humans are both part of the research and development, but equally, they're part of the product itself. And that is happening more and more with technology that are using our behavior as a form of creating a strategic vintage point in the market. So many industries are doing this. I think retailing has been advancing rapidly about this. E-commerce, of course, has been uh, pioneering on understanding behavior and needs as a way of proposing new forms of of uh, uh, new forms of, of uh, uh, you know, commercialization. But we also see uh, healthcare being largely impacted by how our behavior fundamentally impacts sleep, nutrition, exercise. So I think we are looking at our own life as so like a precinct for all of this conversation to really happen. There was a time where businesses were thinking about that there is an inside out proposition from the firm level and the consumer will eventually go out there and consume. Today, I think we're much more sophisticated in rethinking that the point of reference really is, is the more humanistic side uh, of the story. And that's pretty much why in the book we talk about that. So just to give you a reference to that. So I think, uh, Renner, there were three questions, others are four. One, maybe I can answer the yeah. last one and then, yeah. Definitely, so, yeah, um, so let me read it through though. <laughs> yeah, true, true. That's a great question. Right, the question. Yeah, look, I think uh, the question on the U.S. dollar's dominance. First of all, yes, the U.S. dollar is a hegemonic currency, so it's designed to be a vectorial currency to exchange. And today, seventy-eight percent of transactions globally happen through the U.S. dollar, followed by the euro, which is eleven percent. So the gap is significant. Now, I think the Web three is a possibility to rethink in uh, the relationship from the centrality of one currency to the decentralization of the same, but we will not de-dollarize anytime soon. So I think it's important we consider that. And then let me tell you why it's not political. It's more about the non-linear distribution of entangled systems. The dollars is integrating too many aspects of any complex supply chains. 
And so it's difficult for us to rapidly move away from the dominance of one currency to a portfolio of multiple currency with equal weight. Likely what will happen is that there will be a decrease of dependency as we are transitioning to a larger diversity of means of payments, but there will not be a drastic you know, reduction of the US dollars yet. And I don't know whether that will ever happen in the foreseeable future, but I think the idea of Web3 is that we are now empowering more conversations to happen that create a value exchange. The value exchange back in the time was regulated fundamentally through money. Today, it doesn't have to be regulated through money. It can also be part of a close network or reference. That's why cryptocurrencies are quite interested because back to the point that we were mentioning before, uh, and this was emerging in our work in the book, we are currently suffering from an erosion of trust from central systems. We don't trust centralized structure anymore. And so clearly centralized governance of money suffered the same problem. So decentralization has helped us a lot. But when, for example, we are exchanging a Bitcoin against dollars, we're not removing the dependence on the dollar. We're just simply creating an additional way of validating the dollars as a proxy. So I think the question will be over time whether we can move away from benchmarking mm. with existing currencies or not. And maybe not in terms of financial, but it can be in terms of social or environmental exchange, where also money doesn't have to become only a financial transaction, but it could also become any form of validation of value that can be non-financial. And maybe that's a way for the Web3 to accelerate the, the, the dominance from the question from just a single currency model. Reiner, back to you or, or Wallace. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think now we have uh, answered all the, all the questions from the audience. So, but yeah, dear audience, keep, keep questions coming. coming. So we have still um, slightly more than 10, 10 minutes. So I think one of the things I, I wanted to, yeah, maybe it's for, for both of you actually, you know, this, this discussion around that you had also like zero principles or first principles, I think it's, a, it's a really interesting in a sense that um, I'm sure you know the work of Carlotto Perez uh, around sort of techno-economic paradigms. And, and, and in her mm -hmm. work, of course, we are in the middle of the ICT-driven fifth rather than fourth paradigm. And I, I think her point, I think, is what, what, what I men mentioned here is that actually the, the sort of the dominant technology is really driving all those new logics and new ways. So when we are mm -hmm. thinking about climate, we have to think about climate from the perspective of, of ICT and digital technologies in terms of what is there in terms of ways of working, what it allows us to do. And so I would like to sort of pose this both of you as how much you see that actually being sort of like a zero principle that, or let's say it's, it's like the algebra of the zero principle comes from ICT, or, or do you see that actually there are still a other parallel logics as well, like climate, for instance? Yeah, either one of you. Cool. Well, do you have any, I can let you please uh, take it first time if you like. No, I'll, I'll let you go, Mark. I was just going to say that Carlotta yeah. is here and watching. So what do you want to say? <laughs> All right. That's cool. great. That's great. I didn't know that. Uh, look, I think um, right back to your question. Uh, technology has for sure created uh, an alternative way for us to think about many of the conversations that before would have taken an entirely different, uh, you know, logical approach. So I think... There is some inherent uh, zero principle in the way technology is currently operating and I think something we have to recognize. Whether it has been used for the right principle, for the right purpose or not, that's a different story. I think largely today, the overall conversation I'm hearing when I travel is technology still as an hyperbolic means for economic efficiency. We haven't yet crossed the way for technology to become a value creation of a different kind. And so it can work in maybe uh, some aspects, but for example, technology as redefining uh, our climate modeling that will eventually inspire policy. That is a different way of really dealing with, for example, risk mitigation altogether. Technology mm -hmm. redefining our behavioral uh, dimension around finance or for example, saving before saving was basically good practice, goodwill. You have to help people to do that, but it becomes really more of you know free free arbitrary. Today we can look at, for example, behavior nudging that by looking at how technology can model you know performance over let's say twenty years, young families can decide to invest 
simply because they can see their performance over time and therefore mitigate fears coming from the unknown. And that is an entirely different way of thinking about the consulting around financial models that are designed for savings. But what I'm missing still is whether we have enough you know, institutions that are helping people to save. So I think that the zero principle are, in, in, I think, in, in terms of their potential, definitely there. The application, in my opinion, is still quite weak. And, and I think there's a lot of, of uh, ambiguity around where technology is simply helping transitioning faster, but we're using language that tends to go back to the industrial model. It's just okay. that it's about maximizing, in, increasing, you know, it's really uh, so like industrial uh, on steroids. Uh, mm-hmm. And in other circumstances, we see technology as empowering decision-making to come from an entirely different matrix. And that is, I think, the the essence of the conversation is how do I make decision using technology to understand a specific relationship in the, the real world, in terms of the phenomenology of the world, differently from before, differently than the, from a narrow economic exchange. And I think this is where technology can really help us. It can help us because it can it can help us see we can visualize, we can virtualize it, we can become sensorial. So now I can experience it in a multiple way. And I think this is really important. Think about, for example, a child going to school, going through a multisensorial experience through technology. And then there is a whole uh, you know, pedagogical journey to help the child understand any emotions, right? That is where technology can create a zero principle in the way where we're redefining schools. But if we're using, for example, technology just to get people to write from paper to the iPad, to me, that is, unfortunately, is a a poor use of it. Yeah, so uh, uh, as while Wallace is is sort of answering the same questions, perhaps maybe, Mark, you can look at the Q&A because I need Carlotta Perez (laughs) is in the audience. Yes, I see this. I see this. So so Wallace, maybe maybe you want to give your take as well. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that exactly what you said at the end there, Mark, around kind of the design justice principles that are built into the technology that we use for that future. And I think sometimes it can be easy to overlook those kind of underlying values and norms that sit underneath the technological progress. And I think we have to figure out how in this kind of increasingly volatile and complex world, we have to figure out how to ensure that those design principles are at the basis of whatever is developed. But I think um, Carlotta's got a fantastic question around supranational institutions. Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, well, yeah, look, Carlotta, thanks for, my, first of all, thanks for being part of this. I appreciate it. I know your work and I, I'm a fan, if I can say so. Look, the question is this. Uh, you know, Steve, Steve Waddle, a few years back, wrote a book about the global action network. And it was the fact that only supranational institutions, like you call it, are capable of addressing some of the challenges we're having globally. But then you do have to deal with the fact of what you rightly say, highly financialized and mainly financial economy largely inflated in relation to the real economy. Uh, organizations that are so strong that are making it difficult for us to even think, how do we reconcile this? I think having institutions that are much more targeted to a mandate and using back to Stephanie Kelton's work, which I know is also close to Mariana's work, finance not as a creation of debt, but as an investment towards the future. So rethinking our financial model so that it doesn't really accrue into debt largely paid by you know low-income economies. Uh, I think this is fundamentally the difference where we have to rethink in our financial model for the construction of the future. And this construction of the future needs to actually have as well supranational institutions that are going to be able to address this. Back to the question on uh, zero principles. When the United Nations was edified in the, at the end of the 40s, or even the IMF or the World Bank in 1944, that was zero principles. To think about the institution that in their original premise, they wanted to alleviate poverty and avoid financial crisis. And the United Nations, with the fact that we'll have in an organ of, of oversight to avoid the horrors of war. So we had already created an understanding. What we didn't have is the contending power of financial institution. They're going to challenge governments over private sector. I think we have to be clear that you know governments are needed. They are important because they facilitate the creation of value. But it's also important that they contribute to this global mandate that needs to be, I think, adequate 
to the challenge we're having right now. So it starts from updating our current institution. Many of them are obsolete in their original onset, but equally not understanding, as I mentioned before, the rethinking of the financial model that currently is still largely uh, measuring the same way. Which brings me, if you allow me, uh, guys, to the question from Mike. Mike, sure. look, no more than, I mean, me and some of my colleagues, you are pushing an open door. Uh, at Harvard Business School, we started the program back in 2013 called the Social Progress Index. And what we have mainly said is that, look, GDP is largely inaccurate to measure, you know, the quality of life or, or purpose of life or basic needs. It is an economic measure that is only doing what it's supposed to do. And in the same guy who introduced uh, GDP, uh, Simon Kustad in the 30s, made it clear. He said, do never use this for a measurement of social welfare. Of course, we have ignored his warning. So I believe, like you said, that we have to move away from this. We will not move away, so we will not necessarily replace it. But it goes back in the conversation we were having before. The idea is not replacement, it's expansion. Can we expand the way of GDP so that GDP become one indicator across multiple other indicators? And then we're using mainly the ability of data to show us the correlation so that maybe in a given context, more financial resources do help in terms of social environmental uh, purposes. In another context, it doesn't. And therefore, rather than thinking of policy as boosting the economic model, we want a policy that is going to boost social, social contracts. So I think the question is removing from the sense of absolutism, in which I can say for a fact that GDP is good for everybody, to, to a sense in which GDP needs to be understood in correlation that's and a meaning in a statistical terms with other indicators, and then the unique relationship that we are understanding shape policy. So maybe in a given region, it is really a problem with scarcity of resources that is not allowing schools to operate. But in another part of the world, it might be simply that we don't have gender parity in school attendance. And therefore, it's not about having more finance, but having, for example, more program to onboard girls in school. These are conversations I think needs to become power, powerful at the local level. And I think the locally led economic development needs to integrate uh, multiple metrics rather than what happens at the national or international levels, where the only way we have to understand development is with aggregates. So I think the challenge is not the metrics, is that if we use it at the macro level, the only way we can have a conversation is the aggregate level. If you use it at the micro, the local level, we have to be more granular. And I think this tension across is really the critical part. <laughs> Yeah, thanks so much. And, uh, you know, time has uh, flown by. We are already at, at the end of our hour. Our it's incredible, yes. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, like uh, one uh, quick final round from um, from me uh, to both of you, uh, because, you know, we are here in the middle of a master's program as well. So what would you say are like the main implications for teaching public policy, public administration? So both of you, Ulus and Mark, and uh, what would you like to take away from the book and the discussion for what would we need to change in teaching program? I can answer with a very specific response because this is front of mind for me at the moment. This piece around foresight, around scenario planning and the idea of doing foresight that doesn't isn't um, extrapolatory. So isn't coming from historical data, isn't based on a history that was kind of quantifiable and the risks were really different. I think we need to be teaching the next generation of, um, well, we can call them MPAs, we can call them MBAs, the next generation of people in, in the world um, to be understanding how to work within that level of ambiguity, uncertainty and volatility. And I think one of the things that you spoke about really beautifully in the book was this idea of charismatic leadership needing to evolve and needing to be much more aware of um, when to acknowledge what we don't know, how to manage emotional with data, and how to kind of move into perhaps more of an era of agile stability in management and being able to balance between these two things. So that would be kind of a piece from me. Thank you. Mark? Well, it's, uh, you make it easy for me to answer right after yours. I, I subscribe entirely to what you say. And look, there was a question from Theo that we have an answer. So I'm going to use your question, Theo, to answer this question. Look, 
the idea of, for example, engaging more people around, for example, things like the SDGs, they are not zero principle. The SDG is far from zero principle. What is zero principle? is the global uh, collective effort we're putting towards this and what we'll unleash out of it, right? And so I think it's bringing to the fact that teaching the nonlinearity of, of growth or, or evolution is a critical part. Balancing what you well is said, there's a side of, store of, of, the, of the skills that needs to be actually uh, built around uh, the ability to understand data and why it's so critical because an empirical mindset helps but we also cannot stay enslaved in the empirical mindset when we're dealing with future constructs because their future does not exist and there's no data on this. So the ability to navigate the different kind of challenges we're facing so that it doesn't become one a superior form of evaluation, the other one is an inferior one, but it's actually interdisciplinary to the point that the nature of the question we're going to formulate fundamentally trigger the methodology of investigation. That is a skill that I see today rising more at the elective level in the school rather than in the main course. But we still think of the fundamentals to be rooted into the historical, you know, validation of what we used to appreciate. And I think it's important to expand it more and more so that we can do important things that maybe at first they look just a first step and might sound or look incremental. But it's that first step that really opens up not to fulfillment of an incremental journey, but the fulfillment of much more transformational one. And I think this is the narrative that I love to see more in, in, in schools, in MPA programs. And this is the kind of policymakers that we want to build, capable of understanding the world and equally having the courage to generate regulation when they don't understand the world, because it's important nonetheless that they have a voice. Otherwise, It'll, it'll become back to Carlotta's point, largely driven by corporations right, rather than the policy right. uh, the policy uh, efforts. So thank you both. Yeah, it's all about learning. Uh, and I think just to realize that the ways of learning are also expanding and then changing as, as we go along. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark, for, for presenting your book and uh, hope people went out and bought it. And uh, thank you very much also, Wallace, for your wonderful uh, uh, questions and, and commentary. And thanks, everybody in the audience, uh, particularly to Carlotta Veris. Uh, hello, Carlotta. And I uh, hope everybody uh, have a great day or a great evening, uh, wherever you'll be. And uh, see you next time. Right. Thanks, Thank Mark. you for having me, guys. Take all the best. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.